Ladies and gentlemen, I have an admission at the outset tonight. I don't feel adequate to the occasion. Indeed, I have to wonder if any speaker who is not a part of the Armenian life stream is capable of conveying the scope and the anguish of the event we remember today. Somehow I doubt it. I've learned much about you in recent times. I've learned of the pride you have in your ancient culture. While we talk of decades and centuries, you count your history in millennia. I've come to know something of your heritage of learning, your artisan skills, your love for and talent toward poetry and music, the depth of your religious and philosophical life, your consummate abilities in commerce and the professions, your energy and enthusiasm, your dedication to life and liberty, your patriotism, your humanity. And I learned in the process something of the anguish of your 20th century tragedy, the destruction of your homeland, the great genocide, your exile, your betrayal by world powers. But it was only when I began to delve at length and in depth into the details of that overwhelming tragedy, the barbarity that was launched 61 years ago this weekend, that there came to me some sense of the unspeakable loss and continuing frustration you feel. I found it in the words of Arnold Toynbee and of Lord Bryce and Ambassador Henry Morgenthau, who wrote of it as current and dreadful history, and your own writers, who've kept the memory alive and vivid. And most terrible of all have been the simple and straightforward words of the survivors, words to sear the soul and haunt the conscience of all mankind. I confess I found myself weeping inwardly, unbelieving at what I was reading, and realizing how woefully uninformed I had been of one of the critical events of the 20th century, and that being so, how uninformed we all are, we Canadians, and worse, how uncaring. The 1915 massacre is the greatest single unprosecuted, unanswered, unpunished crime of this age. The other genocide, the terrible slaughter of six million Jews before and during World War II, engendered an outpouring of sympathy unmatched in modern history. It led directly to the opening of a homeland to the Jews with the glad consent of much of the civilized world. And it led to reparations, millions and millions of dollars paid by the oppressors to the devastated Jewish nation. But for Armenians, no homeland was opened up. There were no reparations. There was no acknowledgement of guilt. There was only further betrayal. The brave, new, free and democratic Armenian nation launched in 1918 with the blessing of the Allied powers was quickly dismembered. The spoils divided between two lands. An irony of ironies, the Armenian people delivered again into the hands of their oppressors. The great crime is relegated to the footnotes of history, denied by the perpetrators, treated as irrelevant by the rest of the world. As I say, it's a theme too overwhelming for ordinary language, a slaughter of innocence, evil triumphant. A musical genius might tell it in a tragic composition. There are passages of Bach dealing with the suffering and death of our Lord that seep into the heart. A poet or an artist might write or paint something which captures the infinite sadness and despair. But I'm none of these. I'm a reporter and commentator. So perhaps you'll permit me to deal with the subject in the manner I know best. Let me recite the facts and let the facts speak for themselves. Then before I close, some comment. Obviously, you will know a great deal more than I about the painful stories I intend to relate in these next few minutes. They're a portion of your heritage. They're one now with the centuries of cruelties inflicted on you by wave upon wave of invaders and oppressors. I recall them not just as a reminder of the shed blood of the martyrs, but for the sake principally of those present tonight who are not Armenian, but are here because they believe in justice. For the first few days, after April 24th, 1915, it wasn't recognized as an organized genocide. People of the cities of Anatolia and Armenia thought they were witnessing the driving out of Armenians from their own towns or district, a local affair. The males rounded up first and marched away to some labor or internment camp. The women and children and old men a few days later. It was nothing new in Turkey. For more than a generation, an official policy of persecution had been practiced, a policy inaugurated by the notorious Abdul Hamid 
perfected by the infamous Minister of the Interior, Talat Bey, in 1908. After the slaughters of 1895 and 1896, Turkey's Christian minority knew no peace. They were systematically robbed of land and money and power, assigned third-class citizenship, harassed at will by both Turks and their willing allies, the Kurds. So the townspeople of scores of communities across the country saw nothing amiss and one more indignity heaped upon the Armenians. They cheered, in fact, because it meant they would soon be able to claim the homes and possessions of the wretched people as their own. What they didn't know was that it wasn't exile the Armenians were headed for. It was death, a final solution, a fulfillment of Abdul Hamid's answer to the Armenian question, the way to eliminate it, he said, is to eliminate the Armenians. The men went first, marched out of the towns under escort, but only as far as the nearest secluded valley. There they were robbed and murdered, killed by the hundreds, machine gunned smashed senseless by rifle butts, used for bayonet practice, or reserved for a lingering death by torture for the amusement of the troops. The soldiers, police, and Kurdish tribesmen set to the grisly task with relish. There were to be no survivors. And a few days later, the women and children set out too, told that they were en route to a colony, a resettlement district. Some tried to carry food and furniture with them, a few were able to hire carts even, but the carts always returned after several days, after the exile's money ran out. But that was the least of the betrayals that awaited the women and children. Let me quote here verbatim from Arnold Toynbee's contemporary account called The Road to Death. The bands of Armenian women were driven forth on the road. There was an heroism about their exodus, but there was still a loophole of escape the same alternative of apostasy that had tempted their husbands and fathers. And in their case, at least, apostasy brought the certainty of life because the condition laid down was their immediate entrance into the harem of a Turk. Life at the price of honor. Most of them seemed to have rejected it. And yet if they had known what lay before them, they might have judged it the better part. As it was, they clutched at the desperate chance of immunity and presented themselves for the march playing too unsuspectingly into their conductor's hand. For the jailbred gendarmes had no intention of conducting the caravan intact to its destination. Some were sold into shame before the march began. One Muslim reported that a policeman had offered to sell him two girls for about three shillings and tuppence. They sold the youngest and most handsome at every village where they passed the night. And these girls have been trafficked in hundreds through the brothels of the Ottoman Empire. Abundant news has come from Constantinople itself of their being sold for a few shillings in the open markets of the capital. One piece of evidence in Lord Bryce's possession comes from a girl no more than 10 years old who was carried with this object from a town of northeastern Anatolia to the shores of the Bosporus. These were Christian women, as civilized and refined as the women of Western Europe, and they were enslaved into degradation. Yet they were more fortunate than their companions who were denied even this release from their terrible journey. And these were old women, mothers of families, mothers actually with child, who were herded on to meet the intolerable hardships which their journey held in store. And here a quote from the American Committee's report. Women with little children in their arms or in the last days of pregnancy were driven along under the whip like cattle. Three different cases came under my knowledge where the women were delivered on the road, and because the brutal driver hurried them along, died of hemorrhage. Some women became so completely worn out and helpless that they left their infants beside the road. One piece of evidence tells of a woman throwing her dying child down a well, that she might be spared the sight of its last agony. Another woman, stifled in the crowded cattle truck on the Anatolian railway, threw her baby onto the line. Some other eyewitness accounts of the march, quote, They went slowly, most of them fainting from want of food. We saw a father walking with a day-old baby in his arms, and behind them, the mother walking as well as possible, pushed by the stick of the Turkish guard. It was not uncommon to see a woman fall down, then rise again under the stick. At one village, the whole tragedy was enacted in one scene, quote, 45 men and women 
were taken a short distance from the village into the valley. The women were first outraged by the officers and then turned over to the gendarmes to dispose of. According to one witness, a child was killed by having its brains beaten out on a rock. The men were all killed, and not a single person survived out of this group of 45. End quote. Another eyewitness writes of the forced exodus of the last part of the Armenian population from a certain district on June the 1st, 1915. All the villages, as well as three quarters of the town, had already been evacuated. An escort of 15 gendarmes followed the third convoy, which included four to 5,000 people. The prefect of the city had wished them a pleasant journey. But a few hours distance from the town, the caravan was surrounded by bands of brigands and by a mob of Turkish peasants armed with guns, axes, and clubs. They first began plundering their victims, searching carefully even the very young children. The police sold to the Turkish peasants what they could not carry away with them. After they'd taken even the food of these unhappy people, the massacre of males began, including two priests, one of whom was 90. In six or seven days, all males above 15 years of age had been murdered. It was the beginning of the end. People on horseback raised the veils of the women and carried off all the pretty ones. It was the beginning of the end, but there were more horrors before that end was reached. A Reuters dispatch to London from Petrograd on August 20th reads, quote, almost unbelievable details of Turkish massacres of Armenians in Bitlis have reached Petrograd. In one village, a thousand men, women, and children are reported to have been locked in a wooden building and burned to death. In another large village, only 36 persons, it is said, escaped massacre. In still another instance, it's asserted, several scores of men and women were tied together by chains and thrown into Lake Van. On September 15th, the New York Times carries a story reporting all Armenians living in Trebizond, 10,000 of them, were driven to the shores of the Black Sea, transported to distance from shore by ships, and thrown overboard to drown. The scene was witnessed by the Italian consul. The same story details a message sent from Lord Bryce, the former British ambassador to the United States, in which he says, quote, the civilized world, especially American, ought to know what horrors have been passing in Asiatic Turkey during the last few months. For if anything can stop the destroying hand of the Turkish government, it will be an expression of the opinion of neutral nations, chiefly the judgment of humane America. Bryce continued to sound the alarm. In an historic speech to the House of Lords, October 6, 1915, he recited accounts of murder, abduction, enslavement. He put the number of Armenians then known to have been killed or sent into exile at 800,000. He made an impassioned appeal to all the nations of the world, including Germany, perhaps especially Germany, Turkey's ally, to demand an end to this Holocaust, condemnation of its perpetrators, and help for the victims. Britain, let it be remembered, was at war with Germany and Turkey at that time. The United States was not. Washington's ambassador to Constantinople, Henry Morgenthau, was outraged at what he saw and what he heard. He demanded and received assurances that Armenians wishing to leave the country could do so safely. But as one account puts it, it was a promise rescinded cynically the next day. Those who tried to leave were deceived and slaughtered like the rest. Washington went further, warning Turkey that further atrocities against the Armenians would alienate the American people. But it was a warning without an ultimatum, and it too was shrugged off by the gang of ruffians, as Lord Bryce called them, that held sway over Turkey. And so was the appeal to the sensibilities and the humanity of Germany. As Toynbee concludes, Germany was already compromised in the matter of massacre. The atrocities in Belgium 14 months earlier left her in no moral position to demand an end to suppression of a helpless people. Toynbee writes, quote, that was the determining act the Belgium atrocities, that was the signal to Turk and Kurd. And so it was played out to the end, the planned and directed extermination of an entire nation. At the end of the long march from European Turkey to the scorching deserts of the south, with a pitiful handful of survivors, there was a crowning degradation, resettlement on the swamps below Aleppo, or in the searing desert of Der Ersol, comparable, if I may use this allusion, to families from Toronto,
stripped of their every belonging and forced to march a thousand miles north to the Arctic wastes, and they are told to make a new life. But there was a difference. Here in our Arctic, at least we know the Eskimo to be a naturally peaceful and sharing individual. In the Arabian deserts, the Bedouin nomad was anything but. He simply picked up the role of the Kurd as marauder and thief to the helpless and hopeless refugees. Why did the season of terror occur? And what was gained by it? It happened because, as in all crime, there was motive and there was means. The motive was a deep-seated hatred of the Armenians, a hatred based on envy and greed, two of the cardinal sins. The average Turk found it demeaning that these supposedly subject people should prosper, should dwell in fine homes, should possess so much of this world's goods, should excel in so many pursuits, business, the professions, the arts, should have attained such a high degree of cultural enlightenment while he struggled in poverty and ignorance. It didn't matter that the Armenians were docile, accommodating, generous neighbors, posed no threat whatsoever to Turkish authority, and were anxious only to live their lives in peace and goodwill. They were successful, and the Turks were not. They had things, and the Turks hadn't. And that was sufficient rationale for their extermination. So much for motive. A monstrous motive, certainly a stupid one, a short-sighted one too, for when the tragedy had run its course, what was the profit to the Turks? When homes and shops and factories and offices had been plundered and the elite of the cities and towns of Anatolia and Armenia murdered or driven out, the poverty and the ignorance remained and in fact intensified. What's gained when you exterminate the teachers, the doctors, the lawyers, the architects, the merchants, the engineers, the industrialists, the professors, the thinkers of a nation or a city? You cut out the heart of your nation. And so it proved in Turkey in 1915. And there was means, an opportunity, the cover of a world war, the assurance that Germany, the dominant partner, would not interfere, the certainty in Constantinople that spring that Germany was going to win, in which case Turkey would never be called to account for this dark and cowardly and despicable deed. Well, as we know, Germany and Turkey did not win the war. The Allies did. And one would expect when the victors deal with the vanquished, there would be an accounting. There would be retribution for crimes committed against humanity. It didn't happen with Turkey. The emergence of Kemal Ataturk, perceived as a reformer in the eyes of the world, Ataturk, who condemned and rooted out the former rulers, and thereby supposedly lifted the burden of guilt from the Turkish people, lulled most world leaders into the belief that a new set of Turkish promises would be kept. The independent Republic of Armenia was allowed to collapse, and the people who had suffered so much were delivered once more into the hands of their torturers. All this happened six decades ago. For all these years, you've carried the torch. You've struggled against both continued oppression in your homeland and maddening indifference in the councils of the world. While you kept the memory of this atrocity green through books and poetry and music and the network of publications in your own communities, wherever you are in the world, you must feel much of the time that you're talking only to yourself. You have a right to ask why. I'm not sure I have the answers, all of them anyway, but let me take a stab at it. Why doesn't Canada respond? First, because, of course, we would have to condemn an ally, a partner in NATO. And that would be unpleasant, possibly unthinkable in diplomatic terms. Not just an ordinary partner, either, but the indispensable one, the nation on the very doorstep of the country that's supposed to be our enemy. In these special circumstances, criticism of any sort, no matter how justified, is apparently intolerable to our pragmatic external affairs department. 
Turkey argues the merits of continued poppy growing, and we understand. Turkey runs roughshod over the helpless inhabitants of northern Cyprus. And who are we to pick sides? It's an internal matter. If you detect a certain inconsistency in our moral posturing, a certain hypocrisy in external affairs, don't let it bother you. If Turkish poppy growing is tacitly approved as legitimate commerce, but any kind of produce or product from Rhodesia is seen as unclean in the eyes of our federal government, we may be led to conclude that we practice a double standard. Nations necessary to our national interest can do no wrong. Only nations that aren't are subject to our moralizing and sanctions. Secondly, a belief that it's none of our business. It happened long ago and far away in a corner of a world filled with turmoil and in the middle of a great war. What has this to do with open and free and non-violent Canada as we see it in the 20th century? Let the dead bury the dead. Let those who choose to join the mainstream of Canadian life forget the past and focus on the future. What this suggests, of course, is that justice doesn't count as an ideal in our open, free society, and that no history is instructing except our own limited experience. We, in truth, have much to learn, and you who have lived so long, so richly, and so meaningfully have much to teach us. Thirdly, and perhaps this is the most important consideration, even though it's rarely voiced, there's the matter of our national conscience. Genocide is a terrible, the ultimate crime, the murder of an entire people, and any nation practicing it must be singled out and condemned. We all subscribe to that. But who among the major nations is without sin and able to cast the first stone? The United States? Consider the mass killing of Indians on the plains in the 19th century because they were in the way of progress. What difference in moral implication is there between the catchphrase, the only good Indian is a dead Indian, and Abdul Hamid's, the way to eliminate the Armenian question is to eliminate the Armenians. Canada? Well, we of course didn't slaughter our Indians in wholesale lots. We signed treaties with them that merely robbed them of their land and their pride. Their social system condemned them to a fate worse than death. Is a long, lingering death, one that extends over generations better or worse than a swift one? Britain, France, Germany, Russia, China, Spain, do any of these appear before us with unbloodied hands in their dealings with subject peoples and minorities in the long march of history? I'd suggest to you that whether they indicate it or not, those ministers you talk to in Ottawa each year and the government they represent consider soberly the dark possibilities should they see fit to deplore genocide too strongly. If modern Turkey is called on to answer for the sins of 1895 and 1915, by the same token, shouldn't modern Ottawa be held accountable for the treachery and terrorism practiced by federal authorities in three centuries of dealing with our own minorities? This, then, is the measure of your frustration. If no one is listening, if no one cares, how do you keep your cause vital? and engage the attention and hopefully the conscience of the world. By revenge? Yes, I've heard it rationalized, and so have you many times, a guerrilla force, a campaign of terror, fighting fire with fire, a few murders, or as many as you must, to show the enemy you've not surrendered or succumbed, and force the world to know who you are and what you suffered. Well, with every respect to the advocates of violence, I say, please don't. If there's one thing the world doesn't need now, it's one more people resorting to bullet and bomb and the terror of ambush to press a cause. Catholic and Protestant extremists in Northern Ireland take revenge for old wrongs every day of the year. And I ask you, after these years of bloodshed, which is the villain and which the victim? Are Muslim leftists in Lebanon any more noble than Christian extremists? If both advocate sneak tactics and condone the death of innocents, no, the world doesn't need any more violence, nor can it be justified even when it succeeds. Bernard Lewis, the apologist for Turkish behavior, writing in commentary in January 1975, notes, quote, that more than half the members of the United Nations are governed by regimes that use murder and terror as normal instruments of administration and policy. Many respected members of the community of statesmen rose to power by murder and terror, end quote. Respected is an ill-advised adjective. 
In the ultimate court of judgment, we must all answer for the blood in our hands, nations as well as people. What the world does need, and desperately, is the example of one nation, one people, willing to renounce violence and terrorism in order to lead all people to a higher plane of wisdom, truth, peace, justice, and understanding, and in time, brotherhood. You are uniquely suited to that role. You have lived the full span of time. You have experienced every indignity known to man, and you have survived. You were the first of all nations to embrace the faith of the one who taught us to turn the other cheek, to love those who persecute us for his name's sake. It was Anatole France in 1916, as quoted by Archbishop Circassian last year, who wrote, Armenia expires, but will be born again. The little blood that is left to it is a precious blood which generates an heroic posterity. A people who do not wish to die will not die. And adds the Archbishop, the prophecy has been fulfilled. The Armenian nation lives and strives for greater service to mankind. The English poet William Cowper wrote these words many years ago about martyrs, and they seem fitting as we mark the solemnity of this day. To die for the truth is not to die merely for one's faith or one's country. It is to die for the whole world. Their blood is shed in confirmation of the noblest claim, the claim to feed upon a mortal truth, to walk with God, and to be divinely free. May God keep their memory in your hearts. May God bless you.
left Armenia at a very young age after having witnessed the horror and the oppression of the Turkish massacre against the Armenians. Now, what, what one would ask, what was the fault of the Armenians? Just religious differences. Armenians were the first Christian nation. And consequently, in Turkey, there has one uh, ge uh, genocide after the other. Sadly enough for me, I was among the early witness of the massacres in 1914, 1918. So at the age of six or seven, I witnessed this horror. But I had a remarkable mother. I always refer to her as perhaps uh, one of the finest Christian ever. At the age of seven, I went from our constantly interrupted schools by the Turks going home. But the children of Turkish families tried to search our pockets, little children. Now, what could we have in our pocket at the age of six or seven? Few marbles, but they mean a lot to us, to anyone. So I, resent, I resisted giving these marbles to the Turkish children. So they went and stoned me. They threw a stone on my forehead. I was bleeding. And I rushed to my home, to my mother defiantly, and I said, from now on, I will be the one who will carry stones. So my mother took me closer to her, said, son, do you really think they know what they are doing? However, if you have to retaliate in self-defense, be sure you miss. Do not come to their level. And ever since then, I have learned not to hate. So you can imagine what a heritage this is, what a great gift to me. So that I came at the age of 14 to my uncle uh, in Sherbrooke, Uncle George Nakash, who was a photographer, but with the hope that my mother's desire and mine was to be a physician. But to come at the age of 14, totally lacking in academic training, but I may say so, armed with splendid manners. Manners that I considered all people around and uh, very, ever so politely. So, uh, my uncle sent me to school for two terms and much to my good fortune, the first days in school, it was raining in Sherbrooke, snowing, so we had to play games in school. And what were those games? Marbles. But the first handful of marbles was given to me by one of the boys. They only, they saw to it that I won so that I may keep them. What a great contrast. And ever that first day in school in Sherbrooke, Quebec, I have been the recipient of much kindness, much consideration. And the first week or two, I began to be invited to their home. And this cemented my love, my gratitude for Canada.